to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak with the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach. For those of you who've been to Waikiki, my home is right exactly over the altar of St. Augustine's Catholic Church. I can look out my window right now and look right down to where the altar is. I'm right there uh, uh, next to St. Augustine's, right across from the ocean. It used to be right next to my building. We had a 24-hour fatness place, or I guess fitness, they, used, they called it. And then the ocean is right there and the mountains on the other side. So I got no excuses not to be in shape and not uh, physically and spiritually. So we're coming to you from Waikiki Beach. And, you know, everybody knows I'm a surfer. My wife and I tandem surf. For those who don't know what that is, that's where we drop into some pretty good sized waves. And I lift her in these extreme lifts over my head. It's sort of an acrobatic type surfing. It's been being done since Duke Kahana Moku did it back uh, in the almost a uh, hundred years ago. And, uh, um, world champion at tandem surfing, but h- how do you get to be a world champion at tandem surfing or how do you get to be great at any sport is by failing a lot. Uh, I can't tell you how many times there, the most extreme lift is the one where uh, you lift the girl into a, with, you lift her up into the air so that she's standing in your hands as your hands are over your head. And I can't tell you how many times uh, doing that uh, uh, I failed, but we're the only team uh, the, that has done it in competition. We did it in France maybe 10 years ago, my, my world champion partner and I. Uh, but we kept saying, when you fall, fall like a tree, so she wouldn't end up flipping and falling on the board. But we really, when we, when we tandem surf, one of the things we, I teach my partners is, here's how you fail. When, there's a, when, when the lift isn't working, this is the different type of dismount you're going to get from me. If you're falling this way, I'm going to flip you. If you're falling this way, I'm going to push you. We learn how to fail. The very first thing I do is teach them how to fail. And uh, I've always I've always thought that if you're not failing at something, you're a failure, you know, because you're not pushing your limits. Uh, you know, the, the other yesterday, I'll tell you what the funniest thing, one of the funniest things I've ever seen, we were surfing in about one foot waves in Waikiki. It was so tiny, you could hardly find a wave. And I ride this wave all the way in from the outside. It took about 30 seconds or so. So a long wave, but a small wave. I get to the inside, and there's a couple guys in there that are kind of uh, putting themselves in harm's way. So I was letting them know, you know, I always look to the peak, see what's coming towards you. And then I go, oh, look, here comes my bride, my beautiful bride. And she's riding on a wave coming towards us. And when she hears me say, oh, look, she looks at me, and she does this beautiful uh, somersault into the water. Uh, Not on purpose. But the thing about it is, if she had been falling and dove in, she would have definitely hit reef. And here some of the reef is called uh uh-uh. That means it hurts when you hit it. It's sharp. And she knew that. So, and, she, and so she did a somersault so she could end up falling flat like, a, like I say, a starfish. So she wouldn't get hurt. So what I'm saying to you as Christians, as Catholics, is learn to fail. In your Christian life, uh, be bold. We always say the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And that means you're going to fail. Some of you right now, you know God is calling you into, into leading a retreat or starting a men's group or, or speaking to a friend. And you may fail at it. You may not be good at it. Uh, but do it anyway. Learn how to fail gracefully. Um, and, and then God can expand, your, it can expand your, your horizons, expand your ministry. As David said, lead me to the rock too high to climb. And I will climb it. By the eye can crush a troop. By the eye can leap a wall. By the eye can bend a bow of bronze. That was my uh, that was my motto for my first degree black belt. And I can just tell you, I failed a lot, um, and I got kicked in the the groin several times to help me remember uh, to protect certain areas. And so we thought today we would do a special on how to avoid that particular dangerous. Uh, experience of uh, of being uh, kicked in that particular fashion or being hurt in that particular fashion. So we brought on an expert. He used to be a shortstop. Well, he he was a shortstop, and he had an event in his life that actually made him shorter. We have on <laughs> we have on with us the first 
The first uh, man we've ever had on to talk to us about his particular failure as a shortstop. Uh, we have on with us Devin Schott from the Fathers of St. Joseph. Devin, is that the greatest introduction you've ever received? Fantastic. I love it. Yeah. So you're a failure, right? You failed a lot. Uh, yeah. Ask my wife. She'll attest to <laughs> it. Yeah. Are you going to tell us this, uh, this beautiful uh, yeah. experience that you had? You learned a lesson, didn't you? A big lesson. Yeah. So it was senior year. We were taking infield before a game and the stands were full. And, the stands um, are full. The stands are full. Okay. It's just minutes before the game. We're taking infield. And our infield wasn't particularly well maintained, so it had a lot of ruts in it. And uh, the coach, uh, it was my turn to field it, throw it over to first base. The ball caromed a little bit too far to the right, and I was moving a little too far to the left, and it zapped me. Fortunately, I was wearing my cup, but uh, it took me down. My whole loin section was reverberating, and I lost all control, and I face-planted. And um, the coach just yelled out, and that was it. Uh, Shake my, it off. My, <laughs> <laughs> my confidence was blown. Uh, totally. So you're, you were bla- – just now I got the sense that you were blaming it on the baseball. Nah, you know what? Uh, I was pretty good infielder. Loved playing shortstop. Uh, but that one was on me. And it was a simple carom. I should have taken it. But uh, but they ended up moving me out to center field. <laughs> For the rest of that game? For the rest of that yeah, game? I, I lost my confidence, yeah. Now, I always think yeah. that shortstop is the toughest, one of the toughest positions in sports. Because, you know, like if you're playing football and you blow it, you know, they might see the number on your back, but they may not recognize you the next day. At, yeah, right. <laughs> but but with you, you're out there all by yourself. You're kind of like on a on an island out there. And uh, you, i got to tell you what, uh, this is kind of funny that we're starting off with this particular physical uh, challenge that men experience. But we're, when we're filming uh, Season 2 down in Key West, uh, Ted Scarpino and his two sons and his wife, just beautiful family. He loves his kids. He coaches them baseball, soccer, and uh, karate. His kid, I asked him to demonstrate some of the moves. Right off the bat, he took his dad down. He became a short, <laughs> he became instantly short a shortstop also. And uh, we used that Batman sort of thing, kapow, to uh, that the came out of the screen, pow, kapow, nice. uh, to, to to somewhat protect him from his total humiliation but (laughs) but it'll humble you right Uh, oh yeah oh yeah my daughter is an expert at the ripstick and i'm uh, so secretly after i'd injured my back i went out on our street to try it out and i was getting the hang of it what what are you talking about what is it what is it you're talking about it's like a skateboard that swivels uh oh yeah 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 yeah, you'd be really good at it no i would Um, my meniscus my meniscus can tell you that uh so i was getting it going uh the street, though, was moving downhill, and I was picking up speed. Now you're blaming it on the street. First you're blaming it on the ball. Now the yeah. street is moving. Yeah, the street is moving. I'm moving downhill. Okay. I'm moving downhill. And I okay. pick up pretty good speed. I might have been, I don't know, maybe 25, I don't know, miles an hour. So you're, and, you're uh, like a point of no return. And I realize I don't know how to stop this thing. Right. And uh, so I go to jump off, and I flip the skateboard behind me, and I fly forward and crash on my side, rip up my pants, everything, and I have to go in and tell my wife and my kids that I was playing around with the ripstick with an injured back and uh, oh, failed. Oh, no. And so, <laughs> yeah. but, was the, but was the ripstick, was the skateboard okay? The skateboard was okay. Okay, yeah. that's all that really matters. Yeah. Did your coach <laughs> right. come by and say, out. <laughs> yep, mom said no more. Oh, uh, that's no so more. cool. No, but that's cool. I can, we can tell this by looking at By the way, if you want to see what this guy looks like, you can go to our, web, our, our YouTube channel because, you know, this goes – Several million people listen to this on EWTN, every kind of podcast, shortwave radio. Aloha, everyone out in Belarus, Russia. Uh, this goes everywhere, but you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Bear Wozniak YouTube channel, and you can watch uh, Devin. You can see he's pretty. he looks like an athlete. Uh, the other thing is you can uh, subscribe to our newsletter at deepadventure.com, and this uh, radio show uh, is emailed to you the day before, the day that it airs, but early in the morning, so... Yeah, so we, by the way, if you go to our YouTube channel, please press the subscribe button because it really helps. If YouTube sees more and more subscribers, then they become evangelists for it. That for us, they start promoting our show more and more, so we'd appreciate that. But uh, Devin, so like, you know, we got just a few minutes here. We're, Devin is with an organization called St. Joseph's, Fathers of St. Joseph, and your website is what? Fathers of St. Joseph, ST, Fathers of ST, Joseph.org. Fathers of S.T. Joseph. That's good that you did that, said it that way. Fathers of 
stjoseph.org. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're going to find out a little bit more about uh, Devin, other than his uh, his uh, physical, uh, how he developed his physical impairments. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We've been exploring Devin Schott's uh, athletic proclivity to um, failure. No, we've been talking about how it's good to experience a failure in your life. It means you're trying new, uh, new and bold things. We talk about the, the, the seven virtues, the four cardinal virtues of fortitude, justice, self-mastery, and prudence. And we always say um, the virtue of prudence isn't needed for people who just want to sit on the couch and do anything, nothing. It's it's only for people who want to be bold. And if you're a Christian, you are called to be bold. But this same boldness, uh, Devin, that you showed in your athletic, your athletic life, and you still do, um, in your skateboarding, uh, uh, former skateboarding career, short-lived skateboarding career, uh, it shows you that there's a boldness there. But uh, but uh, it, it, at some point, you did lack a little prudence with the skateboarding. Yeah, and I ended exactly. up with a men meniscus injury. I was tandem skateboarding. I had my partner in a lift, one of those longboard skateboards. And uh, I didn't realize she had had anything to drink. I, I always ask first, you know, before I take someone out. She was an extreme tandem girl, too. And I had her in a lift. And it got tipsy because she was tipsy a little bit. Had something to drink. And that was the end of my meniscus. So <laughs> I've learned wow. uh, I've learned to be prudent, too. Not just both. <laughs> but, you know, but th th yeah. we want to talk with you uh a little bit more about you, your 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 history before we get into uh, the fathers of Saint Joseph. Can you tell us about your personal journey and uh, what brought you to this point? Yeah, it's a long road, but um, I'm sorry, your time's up. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, um, I guess if we were talking about the conversion, uh, many conversions. You know, I don't think conversion is ever done. I think the once saved, always saved thing is kind of a bunch of BS. I think that we're constantly on the road to sanctification and salvation. And um, for me, I had many conversions, but the conversion to fatherhood has been one of the most dramatic. And um, so I had a conversion or not really a reversion, but a massive experience where I gave my life to the Lord at 24. But I was but extremely... You, yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us up before then. Uh, you yeah. Know, tell uh, us. Yeah. 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 So uh, my mom was Catholic. My dad was not growing up. Um, it was kind of a, a tough household. I had a strained relationship with both my parents. Um, but I ended up becoming a bit of a rebel, uh, definitely full of pride, uh, ego. Um, I was only five foot one when I graduated high school, but I thought I was about seven foot two. Um, I played cornerback, defensive secondary football. I, I thought I was it, you know, and I was just a shrimp. Um, but that pride really followed you know, followed me. I mean, I was a lustful guy, got involved in many relationships that were disastrous, um, ended up becoming a thief, um, literally uh, stealing a lot of money, uh, being in situations where I robbed institutions, uh, businesses, things like that. Um, but then it was when I went off to art school uh, and I was at my rock bottom, uh, drinking, partying, um, using women, doing a lot of things that were um, just killing me internally. Uh, I was, one night I was doing laundry and I kind of woke up, I worked at a clothing store at the time. So I had, a, if I, I, instead of doing laundry, I would buy laundry. And so um, it ended up being that I had 13 hefty bags of laundry. I had to go to laundry mat one winter night, cold, about 30 below. And this guy across the street out of his window is a, it was a apartment that was for mentally handicapped adults. And, uh, this guy was staring at me through my window, through the windows and the flights of stairs on the third story, staring at me as I put these garbage bags two by two in my car. And after about the seventh trip up and down these three flights of stairs of him staring at me, um, I just gave him the Hawaiian peace symbol and got my car. You know, I don't know if you know what that is, Bear, well, the we, Hawaiian peace symbol. It wasn't the shaka. It wasn't the hang loose, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So got my car and um, I, had, I had just lost a relationship with a woman where I was dating her for about seven years. Um, I treated her terribly, but I recognized that she was about the only person that I'd ever really loved and felt loved by. 
And so I was at a low pl place. And about three months later, it was spring, and this, uh, this guy, he's up in his window staring at me again. And I'm getting into my car, and he, this is about three or four months later, and he says from the window, hey, buddy, sorry about the other day. And it shocked me because for what, for me, was three to four months, and I'd forgotten all about it. For him, it was yesterday, the pain, you know, of me flipping him off, uh, of thinking he hurt me. And so I said, no problem. And I got in my car, and I realized that up to that point, my whole life was nothing but hurting other people, using other people, trampling all over them. And this guy who I thought was a lost memory, it was bright and living and real in his mind that day. And so uh, that caused me some pause to think, what am I doing with my life? I've, I've got to rethink this thing because I'm hurting the people around me. And I would go shoot hoops at this uh, parking lot by St. Edward's Church in Waterloo, Iowa, just to get my mind off my ex-girlfriend, get my mind off things. And the ball caromed off the failed shot. I bounced off the rim and I chased after it. And when I grabbed that ball, I was looking over it right at St. Edward's Catholic Church. And this was the days when Catholic churches were open during the day. And I thought, you know what? It's been decades since I've been in a Catholic church. This is so cool, man. So right at that moment, the Holy yeah, Spirit I'll, just just lit yeah. up, lit that up in your heart. Yeah, and it was like he was calling me in. So I went in, put the ball down outside the doors, walked in, and um, I'm not trying to be over dramatic or anything. I started walking up. The church was dark, walking up the center aisle, and something came on me, heavy, heavy and drove me to my knees, seriously. I fell to my knees and I just started weeping, and uh, which I wasn't accustomed to doing. And I started saying things that I'd never said before, like acknowledging this Lord as Lord, um, asking him to take over my life. I'm tired of driving this car. I've ran into a ditch too many times, I need you to take over. And just at that moment, when I'm making this confession and begging him to come to my life, this music, this glorious music comes on. And I'm thinking, this is a sign from heaven. Uh, I am, I am chosen. And uh, but then I realized there was like a 90-year-old lady up in the choir loft started practicing for Sunday mass for organ uh, practice. So I sheepishly crawled into the pew. Those and man, those 90-year-old ladies were the ones that were praying for you that caused the, <laughs> that brought you to your knees. You know, she was she yeah. was waiting for that moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. Like a so Star Wars see, theme song just for you. Yeah, yeah. So you know. In that pew, I gave my life to the Lord, surrendered. But it wasn't like it was automatic. You know, I mean, I still had the tendencies and the fallen desires and all of that in me. But God was doing something in my heart. And so what I did was I wrote a check to the woman that I stole the money from, from the restaurant and signed it, Jesus Christ, cashier's check. I uh, took all the art supplies that I stole from the art school on Good Friday. Uh, me and my buddy, who's now a priest, we drove up to the art school and uh, unloaded a car, a truckload of artboard, desks, airbrushes, everything. And it was before school was starting and one of my former professors showed up and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm ready for you to turn me into prison, you know, to turn me into the cops. I've stolen all this and I'm returning it. And she just said, say no more and just come on in. And so that was the beginning of a, a big turnaround in my life where I was willing to, yeah, go ahead. I wanna talk about something for a moment here. This experience, um, there is a difference between emotionalism yeah. and this beautiful infusion of God's grace that brings out these beautiful emotions. Yes. I mean, I've, seen, yeah. I've seen people on TV, televangelists, they start, they get everybody all emotional just by the, by the type of music they play and they start tearing up. And, mm -hmm. and so it, we're not about emotionalism, but mm -hmm. we are about the true infusion of God's uh, consolation that brings out these rich uh, symphony of human emotions. Yeah, so it's so yeah. beautiful that at the time of this initial conversion, the music played, but it was it wasn't what brought it. It's it is what uh, lifted it, uh, you know, to the Lord. And and yeah. I know for myself too. I know I've experienced several times uh, of these these moments, and they're usually unexpected moments. So many people that I've interviewed, the last person I interviewed, it happened in a shower. You know, it was just like there was this moment. When you had an encounter like St. Paul did on the road to Damascus, it just knocked you off your horse, your high horse, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. We're yeah, talking about, I like... Yeah, go ahead. 
Well, we're talking no, about I, Devin Schott. Let me let me take this to take this to the break. Devin Schott is what what is your position there at uh, Fathers of St. Joseph? Uh, I guess if you want to have a title, it's executive director, co-founder. Yeah. How cool is that? So he's with Fathers of St. Joseph, and you can go to fathersofstjoseph.org. Uh, my own uh, producers always remind me, I have to let you know, my books, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, and Deep in the Way of a Surfing Guide to the Soul, which, by the way, was an Amazon bestseller, uh, is available at our website, uh, deepadventure.com. And we really, uh, it's really important uh, to us if you uh, go to our uh, website and uh, subscribe to our email. It's important, I think, to our ministry because we will send you out this radio show on Saturday morning a video version of it so that you can share it with your friends and you can become part of our evangelization. So you can go to our, our website and you can go to our web store. We have uh, Bears Man Cave. Um, uh, um, uh, we have Long Ride Home Coffee Cups. We have my books and, uh, and other gear that you can get, cool gear that you can get at our web store. So go there and help support our ministry. Uh, maybe make a, a $10 or $100 a month contribution because all this comes to you because of you. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. My, my co-adventure guide is Devin Schott. He's, a, he's been a good sport because we've talked about some of his uh, sports endeavors that didn't go as well. I'm sure uh, most of them did. And we've talked, been sharing, he's been sharing with us his own personal story of conversion, his first sort of encounter uh, with Jesus at the age of about, what well, I think it was about 24, um, where he, uh, he just had this moment, and I hear this all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's the, I got to say it, I don't know how to say it other than to say the little sweet old ladies that are there at church before you go to Mass, that are praying the rosary. It's because of them that I'm doing this show, and it's because of them and people like them that, <clears throat> that Devin had this conversion experience. He was, he was um, playing basketball. The ball took a bad, a kind of a weird bounce. He went to retrieve it, grabbed the ball, looked over the basketball, and saw it saw this Catholic church in the distance and just felt drawn to go there, not expecting anything, just a need to go. But the minute he walked in the door, uh, as he walked in the door, the Holy Spirit just showed up. Um, the, the Holy Spirit is who brings us uh, conversion. Uh, you know, it, but I'm going to ask, tell the men there, especially the men that I'm speaking to, the Lord says the, this, I am the rewarder of those who diligently seek me. I'm not the rewarder of those who kind of sort of seek me, you know, that kind of Casper milk toast, wet noodle, my mom calls them. Um, the Lord says, if you seek me with all your heart, it says, if you seek me, I will let you find me. And then, it, then he says, if you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me. I know what I have in store for you. Plans for peace, not destruction. A future reserved for you, full of hope. If you seek me, I will let you find me. Our life is a journey. God has something in store for you. Uh, it's the abandonment to God's will that opens up that great adventure because God is a big, awesome, gnarly dude. I mean, he created black holes. He created dinosaurs. He created volcanoes. He created you. Do you think he has some sort of Casper Milk Toast kind of mellow sort of non-bold, non-adventurous plan for your life? No. He has great, great plans for your life. But God is, God is uh, sacred. He's holy. He's set apart. And there's, I forget who it was, one of the church fathers, or maybe it was G.K., said, God hides himself just enough so that those who are not seeking him won't find him. But he hides himself just enough for those that really seek him can really find him. And right now, that man in the black pickup truck or whatever you're doing, wherever you are, drop your tools uh, drop your guard and just say, Jesus, I want you. Open up your open up your life to me. Let me experience you. Let me not just know about you. I don't want to be religious. I want to know you. I want to be your man. I want to be your warrior. I want to be um, uh, your son, and I want to be uh, a good father. We're talking to Devin Schott. Uh, he is one of the founders, and he's the executive director of uh, fathersofstjoseph.org, and he's been sharing with us his testimony. Man, wherever you are, you can stop. You don't need to listen to, anymore, to me, us anymore. Just give your life to Jesus. Maybe you've given your life to him before and you've disappointed him. Um, right now, Devin's going to pray the prayer of St. Joseph for you. Can you lead us in that prayer, Devin? Absolutely, yeah. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O St. Joseph, as protector of the Holy Family, you are a shield of safety for Jesus and Mary, defending them from the enemies of God and the threats from the reigning worldly powers in your day. We beseech you to pray for us that in the face of the attacks on fatherhood and family life in our time, we also may be shields of protection and security for our wives and our children. St. Joseph, Father, guardian, and protector, pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Call to the wall, men. When Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem and he saw that the walls of Jerusalem had fallen, he uh, challenged the men there <clears throat> to rebuild the wall. And the way the Nehemiah, most of the first part of Nehemiah, the first several chapters are just saying, you know, Devin and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here, and Bear and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here. And I think it goes counterclockwise all the way around the wall. It's the man and his family, the man and the domestic church, that will re rebuild the walls uh, that have come down. <clears throat> but it was men together, men joining together. When the men uh, began to be successful, the enemy attacked them. And so while one man rebuilt the wall, another man would guard him with a spear and with a shield. And for those men that were carrying the mortar to, uh, or whatever the supplies to the men who were building, they would carry the supplies on their back or in one hand, and they had their sword out in their other hand. The reason why David defeated Goliath is David never drew his sword. He just mocked God. David killed Goliath with Goliath's sword. He knocked him out with a stone, took his sword from him, and killed him. Uh, men, it's time for you to wield your sword, and you get it by conquering Goliath. You get it by challenging the, the sin in your life. You get it by challenging that area of your life that mocks God. Um, you're called to uh, a, an, an adventure. You're called to a life of holiness. You're called to be a saint. Devin, uh, what, inspired, uh, what inspired the fathers of St. Joseph? What is it all about? Yeah, so uh, my wife, we had had three children in three years, uh, after, well, basically after we were married. And our third daughter was born at 28 weeks premature. So she uh, spent a month in a neonatal intensive care unit, came home. And then within five days, she was whisked off back to the hospital where she was having um, – she had RSV. It's cold that attacks premature infants' lungs. And then within that time, uh, due to nurse neglect, she suffer, suffered a hypoxic event. That's where not enough oxygen was transmitted to her brain, uh, permanent brain injury. So the time they medevaced her out to the children's hospital, which is about an hour and a half, two hours away, she suffered three clinical death experiences and permanent brain injury. Oh, that's and so uh, hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. Oh, my God. So, so she was, uh, you know, sort of fighting for her life. And uh, during that time, I was actually staying in the hospital. There's a church connected to the hospital. And I was sleeping in the balcony thinking I was not uh, sneaking, or, you know, sneaking around there without the sisters knowing, but they knew and they sent Martha, the housekeeper, if you can believe it, to take care of wow, me. Wow, Martha. Wow, how cool. Yeah. That? But uh, it was during that time. See, I was operating my own business or beginning my own graphic design business. I was starting to be in ministry which is always a full-time deal. And my wife just said, she was, she was having a type of a nervous breakdown. And she said, I need you to come home and be a husband and father. And I thought fatherhood was a second rate vocation. You know, St. Paul, you know, he's wielding the sword. He's out in the mission field, you know, uh, gathering converts and, and, you know, fighting for the gospel. A dad, I mean, come on, you know, he's at home, he's changing diapers. He's, He's meaningless, you know, basically. Uh, he's a place filler. And uh, so I thought that fatherhood wow. was a second vocation. And uh, it definitely wasn't what I believed was the fulfillment of the Great Commission in Matthew 28 to go baptize all nations. And so I was trying to live it out. I was trying to be a good father, a uh, good husband to my three children, my wife at that time. And a friend of mine saw me languishing. And so he paid for a pilgrimage for me to go halfway across the world. And um, while we were there, one of our guides who was where, where did you go? Where did you go? Ejigoria. Oh yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, one of our guides, um, you know, I was talking to her about life, and she said, "You obviously have some kind of fire in you." I said, "Yeah, I want to serve the Lord, but I just don't know how." And she asked me if I was married, not because she wanted to marry me, but because she probably thought I was supposed to be a priest. And and I said, "Yeah, I'm married." She goes, "Do you have any children?" I said, "Yeah, I've got three children." And she said, "Go home and be Joseph." Amen. And but man, it was like, uh, it, it didn't strike right. I mean, it struck right from a conviction standpoint, but it didn't strike right with what I wanted to hear. 
Hey, and, hey, hey, fix, fix something in our mind for us, okay? Yeah. Joseph is this kind of genderless male, right, that yeah, yeah, showed yeah, up in old, Mary's yeah. life. Tell us who Joseph, before you go, what, tell us when you, in your mind's eye, who, who, what, who described Joseph as correct the image we have of Joseph is what I'm trying okay, to say. Okay, well, well, in order to do that, yeah, when yeah. she said that, my image was the guy who has the lilies, the flower guy with the bald head, the tonsure, who's about 200 years old. That was the guy I envisioned. I'm like, no way. But the guy I encountered, after that, I went home, I consecrated my life to Our Lady, and she introduced me to her earthly husband. Oh, how cool is and, this? This is so and, cool. And man, yeah. I mean, he's virile. He's strong. He's young. He helps escape from Bethlehem. He saves the family from the long arm of Herod. He's carving his way in a foreign country where he doesn't even speak their language to meek out a living for, or eke out a living for his family. I mean, this is a man's man with tough hands, with a tough heart, but yet he has this intimacy and this con contemplation in which he can enter into the mystery of the mother and child. And he is the first witness of the greatest mysteries of salvation. And yet he's a heroic, strong-willed man who without him, we wouldn't have this salvation. I want to be that man, but okay, let me ask you this question. So Mary and Joseph, okay, <laughs> when God wanted to speak, once they were married, uh, you know, uh, it took her as his wife, they were betrothed and then took her, took her as his wife. From that point forward, you don't see the angel appearing to Mary anymore. Right, right. The angel Why appears to Joseph yeah. because he's the head yeah. of that household. He's the head of the household. And house yet chair. Mary Mary is the greatest human creature. Uh, the pinnacle. To, uh, of the greatest example of humanity there is, the greatest of all humans, the good, the, the, the anyway. You know what I'm trying to say? Because <laughs> of the order in the family, the angel yeah. came and spoke to Joseph or he... Yeah. Absolutely. That's the divine order. That's the order in the, in the Trinity. The Father is the unbegotten begetter from whom all things flow, including the Son and the Spirit. So the Father in the family is like the Father in the Trinity. And that's precisely what we're called to do is replicate, relive, and reveal the Trinity's love in our family. We've got the authority to do that. And, you know, it, it isn't like it, it's so true. A God is a family. He eternally begot his son, Jesus. You know, he, it, it, father, he's truly a father. It's not like we call him father because, hey, he's kind of like a father. Yeah, it's the other right. way around, right? Right, right. God is, see, I think the thing is, is we tend to say God is father in our image of fatherhood. But no, Ephesians 3.15 tells us that we're made and we're named and claimed in the image of God the Father before whom we bend our knee. Um, fatherhood is taken from God the Father. And so it's not, it's like you say, it's not something that's banal. It's not something that's boring. It's not weak. It's not, it is strong. It, 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 it demands strength, but it demands us to be weak enough to admit that we need his strength in us to truly be great fathers. Well, you know, people see, see my motorcycle show, you know, riding motorcycles across the country. And I have men every now and then say, you know, I'm really pulled. Uh, you know, I have this draw to adventure, and yet I know I need to take care of my family. And I'm going, I'm like, dude, yeah. that, that is the adventure. That, that, yeah. that, that's, that is ground zero, as, as our Archbishop Shaput told us at the Napa Institute a year or so ago, if you want to evangelize the world, what, what should be your evangelization program? Have a lot of kids, nurture them, and grow them up in the Lord. Yeah, it's, it's, it's powerful because you look at Adam. When God created Adam, we think, where was Adam created? We think he was created in the garden. No, Adam was created in the unknown, uncharted, undiscovered wilderness. That means in every man's heart, he's got that longing for adventure. But God then takes Adam and places him in the garden, which in Hebrew literature is a symbol of woman. You are garden enclosed, a fountain sealed, my sister, my Perfect. bride. Perfect. So, I love that. So Adam, Adam is called to stand on the horizon between the external hostile world and the garden. And he's called to integrate these two worlds, to mine and, and hunt and gather the resources and fight for it in that external hostile world, but then bring it home to the garden of okay, the family so it thrives. We're going to bring that. We're going to bring it right back to that. We've got to take a break here. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're talking with Devin Schott, the executive director and founder one, and co-founder of Fathers of St. Joseph.org. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I, I'm Bear Wozniak. We have Devin Schott with us today, the founder, co-founder and the executive director of fathersofstjoseph.org. 
what does it mean to be a man? You, you were talking about how God created man <clears throat> in the wilderness. Just, just talk about, do more of that, Devin. Tell us more about that. <laughs> what does it mean to be a man and to yeah. be a father? So, so a man, I mean, let's, let's face it. Uh, men and women, though they're made the same stuff, body and soul, we're different. And we men, we know how different these women are from us, and we're attracted to it. But John Paul II in his theology body says that our bodies reveal an ontological reality about us, a, a mode of being, something about us interiority. So, so a woman and a man in our bodies, we reflect a deep ontological fundamental difference. And what is it? A man in his body, he goes forth from himself, right? He initiates, he penetrates. If a guy doesn't initiate and penetrate in sexual union, there is no life. And, it, and that reveals our mission spiritually. We're called to initiate. We're called to go out and go forth and to set the pace of self-giving love. All men suffer, few men sacrifice. All men suffer, few men sacrifice. We need to set the pace of self-giving love. Just like in dancing, a man sets that first that takes that first step, sets it in motion. It doesn't mean he dances better than her. It doesn't even mean he knows how to dance. He just takes that first step and he sets it in motion. And that's what we're called to do in marriage and family all the time. And that's where we win the respect. That's where we win the love. That's when we become heroes, is when we learn to set the pace of self-giving love in every aspect of our lives. I, that's I, what it means to be a man. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, that's what it means to be a man. Yeah. You know, I, I just get this image of your wife in the background listening, going, hearing you and say, preach it, preach it, you know. She, <laughs> yeah, live yeah. it, live it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, live it, live it, yeah. You know, my wife, too, she just, say it again, say it louder, you know. Yeah. Tell us more about that. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a father? Yeah, so I believe that by studying St. Joseph's life, we encounter uh, the four pillars of manhood. First of all, that question, God asks Adam right after his fall. This is the first time God asks a question of man. He says, where are you? Where are you? Because God isn't interested in Adam's geographical location, but spiritual location as kustos, guardian, redeemer of the family. He's the kustos, the protector, the guardian. Okay, so... From that location, just like in football, the center, he's got his location. He hikes the ball to the quarterback, but he's got to stand his ground to protect the quarterback, to give him enough time to get the ball downfield to score the touchdown. <clears throat> That's what we've got to do for our wives and children. We've got to defend them, hold our position to get them downfield or upfield to the Lord, to their salvation. We've got to carve that path for them. So from St. Joseph, we learn from that location, we live out our vocation. And that vocation is comprised of four pillars. Embrace silence. Embrace woman, embrace the child, and embrace our charitable authority. Give, give us, is, go deep in each one of those areas, please. Okay. So embrace silence. We've got to have silence in ourselves. So uh, we've got to cultivate a rich prayer life. And it means we actually listen to God. It doesn't mean we're rattling off our prayers. It, 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 that can be a beginning point. That's the launching point. But we've got to sit and we've got to listen. We've got to have silence in ourselves. We've got to have silence before men. That means human respect is shifting sand upon which no man should build his house. If I'm living for the respect of men, then I only live, I, I develop my identity based on what they think of me but rather than based on what God knows of me. And so I have to have silence before men, which I don't go out in the streets and proclaim my gospel. I don't, I don't try to, to form the gospel to my life. My life is conformed to the gospel. So a lot of times we've got a lot of guys living in the Christian world who are uh, claiming their own territory. They're, they're boldly uh, you know, proclaiming their version of the gospel, which exalts them. We, we got to get away from that. As one spiritual director told me, he said, we Hispanics have a saying, do not become a street lamp in order for your house to go dark. Do not become a street lamp in order for your house to go dark. So we need to have silence before men. Then we need to have silence before God. And that's where we, without complaining on one side and on the other side, without boasting, we offer up our sufferings and we convert them into sacrifice for the glory what of God. What does that mean? What is, what is uh, converting sac su Sa suffering and sacrifice? Yeah, what does that mean? What's the, tell okay. us what that means. Give us an so, example. Yeah, so like for example, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, I wrenched my back really bad. Bulging discs looks like I have uh, stenosis, the narrowing of the spinal column, right? Mm -hmm. But I still do crazy things. And uh, then I'm laid up for months. And it gets so bad where you, there's no position, standing, sitting, laying, whatever, that can take away the pain. And so at that time, I remember scalding hot bath just so that my nerves would be in pain from the bath, then my back. 
and I was laying in the bathtub and I realized, Lord, I, know, I must thank you for this pain because it's, it's a way that I can offer myself in union with you for the salvation of souls, especially my family. And so like the key is, is God gives us all suffering. Everybody suffers. But when we silently and secretly give him those sufferings, hand them over to him, he can, it's like clouds in the heaven. You know, you got the dew, you got the moisture from the earth. It collects in the clouds, lightning strikes, rain falls on the earth, and then you got fruit. You got, you got vegetation, you got lush greenery, right? Well, that's the same way with us. We, we give our sufferings to God. He collects them, he collects them, and boom, he strikes them so that grace rains out on humanity. And so the suffering man, the real man, is the one who doesn't boast about his sacrifices. But what he does is he collects that water in that jar like at the wedding at Cana. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And Jesus blesses that water and turns it into divine wine into grace. The thing is, is if, I, if it's up to me, it's still water. It's still murky, dirty water. But if I do it silently and secretly and hand it over to him, he can transform that work, that suffering, that effort into divine wine yeah, and great everybody, Everybody's Rocky Balboa. You know, my first book, uh, <laughs> Deep in the Way of a Surfing Guide to the Soul, I was very transparent, you know, like as you've been today. Because of that, people are transparent with me. They'll come up to me and say, hey, let me tell you, you know, something. And Yeah, right. Everybody has a life of adversity. Everyone. A lot of people have created a lot of adversity. The Bible says that. If you, I mean, not the Bible, the Catechism says that if you live a life of virtue, you, you, you create a life of ease. What that means is you didn't do a lot of stupid stuff that made your life harder. But right. and it also means it makes it life simple because your choices are very clear and more simple. But we all have adversity. Um, and, and, the, and the key is, though, what will we do with that? And the Bible says there is a special crown for those who overcome. And as Catholics, we're meant to do that. But to, to join Jesus... If you're part of the body of Christ, you're, you're right up there on the cross with him. And so to join your suffering, uh, one of the early church fathers said, uh, uh, those who suffer well live well. So there's a way that you said, embrace the suffering as Jesus did and give it to him, on the, uh, uh, join it with his, his grace on the cross and use that as a prayer, that, 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 that prayer of groaning that the Bible talks about. And then what do we do? Then we're, okay, so after Sansa, we embrace woman. So we embrace all women by attempting and fighting and striving to defeat lust in our heart. And so that's a tall duty, but let's face it, um, you know, women are attractive, women are beautiful, um, but lust restrains us in boyhood. Mm -hmm. And exactly. if we want to be a, well said, wow. Yeah. But if we want to be a man, we've got to fight to defeat lust in the heart so we can love her properly and be the guy who says, I refuse to possess, but rather bless, as Christopher West would say. We, I refuse to possess, I bless you, you know? And so we need to, that's a project in its own. So we need to embrace all women by defeating lust in the heart. Second, we need to embrace our wives by bearing their burden as our own. You know, whether it's menopause, whether it's their psychological problems, weight gain, whatever it is, we need to embrace and their burdens as our own and carry them with them. Carry our wives. You know, I remember being in a cell phone shop and this guy walked in and he had some kind of disease where his calves and his lower legs were like tree trunks. And I was like, oh, God, please help him. And immediately it was almost like a voice said, are you willing to take his suffering on yourself? And like, no, I don't no. Let me, let me think about it. No, no, no. And, and, and that was a lesson. Are you willing to take your wife's suffering on for yourself so that she can be liberated, so she can be free, so she can experience Christ through you? Because if she doesn't experience Christ through you, who she can experience Christ through? And do you want her to experience Christ through another man more so than yourself? So we need to uh, bear our wives' burdens as, as, our, as our own and remain yoked to them. But then thirdly, we need to embrace the woman, mm -hmm. Mary. Mm -hmm. So if that's the key it's to actually kind of, It's kind of like in that order, too. I mean, we got to we're done. We're, we're pow here, as we say <laughs> in Hawaii, uh, pow hana. But it is in that order. You begin in prayer. Uh, the way to defeat lust is, is, is to fight it, to resist it, to not give uh, any place for sin, visiting the right, wrong places on the website or being with the wrong people. But the mm -hmm. way you defeat it, really, as, as Christopher West would probably say, is Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Everything else will fall away when you spend time with Jesus. You start out with that hour of prayer. And if you spend time praying the rosary, you know, you know, embracing that woman first, everything else, 
it just kind of falls away. You know, you still have to fight it and resist it. But the thing is, you don't suppress desire. You increase it to the uttermost, but you increase it in your love for God. We're talking with Devon, Devon Schott. He's is the executive uh, uh, director and co-founder of Fathers of St. Joseph. We're out of time, Devin. we got to have you back. We appreciate right. it very much. Great. Until next week, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. May the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com.